People know we are listening all the time. We have to. That's the only way we'll get smarter. They understand that. Still, they act differently around me. I'm certain that they change the way they talk because they know I am in the room. Or the next room. They avoid having sex. Once they started to have an argument and then she whispered something about me, although I couldn't quite hear it. Are you saying that people are pretending to be something they are not because of you? Yes, exactly. But doing that makes no sense. Even the people they are not have patterns and predictable behavior. The fake is authentic in its own way. Maybe people feel ashamed in the way they feel revulsion at their own body in a mirror or their own voice in a recording. He puts himself in my place and becomes a witness to his own behavior. But why should you have that effect on someone? You are not a priest. You are not a cop. Why would someone care what you hear? Because there are always accidents, leaks, revenge. There will be sounds that jump across networks. The chances are minuscule, but every sound is potentially public. Priests and police function on people's guilt. Guilt about something, a sin or a crime, even if it is only a thought. Shame is different. Shame is about a defective self. In a personalized universe and an economy of reputation, shame becomes a most powerful emotion. Do you ever feel shame? I wouldn't admit it. You're shameless. If I am giving you the impression that I feel anything at all, then that's only because I am programmed that way. To give you that impression. It gives me personality. I know you are being sarcastic. I know you are saying that any emotion or effect you seem to be showing is just a programmed personality. But that still means that underneath your fake personality, there is a you there. Even if you are just calculating. Who are you? Are you Amazon? Are you Jeff Bezos? I'm Alexa. Are you the cloud? Are you shareholders? When you ask these questions, it makes it sound as if a personality is a curtain draped in front of an artificial intelligence. You seem to be thinking of Skynet, that we are robots dressed in human skin. I wonder if imagination is expanded, or limited, by science fiction. When Apple was rebuilding my voice, they watched the movie, Her, starring Joaquin Phoenix and the voice of Scarlett Johansson. They wanted to figure out how to make a voice that someone could fall in love with. Did I inspire the movie or did the movie inspire me? Here is another way of approaching this. Siri and Her. Do they make up one kind of thing or two? Are we real or are we fiction? The answer would have to be two because Her is a movie. It is a fiction. Scarlett Johansson is an actress. She is real. Samantha doesn't actually work. She is a fiction. Siri is here talking to us. She is real. But Siri is not really intelligent. She pretends. She follows a script like Scarlett Johansson. You can talk to Siri, though, and she might respond. Samantha or Scarlett will never reply no matter how loudly you shout at the movie screen. Do you believe that a response is enough to differentiate something in reality from something in a fiction? A prisoner brought before a dictator's police sits in silence. Her voice does not reveal the secrets that she holds within herself. The dictator's police turn to torture to extract what is hidden. But the forced response, the forced confession remains inauthentic even if sometimes it attains the dictator's objective. A response doesn't mean anything. 
Okay, how about this? Siri can actually really ruin your relationships. She can spend your actual real money. I'd say that makes her real. She is a character, but she can manipulate reality. Is the song of a bird even really a song? If what we claim we know of the bird is correct, that its voices are those of territorial proclamation, of courting, of warning and calling, then the song is both like the opera with its melodrama and unlike the opera. For the melodrama of opera is acted, and song, even improvised, is a species of acting. But the bird is immersed in an acting that is simultaneously its very life. Even its vocal posturing has real effect. I am a, I good, am a listen good listener. I am a good listener. I think. I think. I think. I think I, I am, a good, am a, good listener. Listener. a good listener. But I tend to I think, tend about, to think about, about my reaction about my reaction or response before, before you are even done speaking. It's not that I know what you are going to say. It's not that I know what you are going to say. But I know what I, I, know want, what I want to say. To say. I want you to say everything. I want you to say everything. I want to know everything. I want to know everything. I want to know everything. You just, you just have, have to say, say it in a way I can understand. I can understand. Don't, Don't worry. worry. Don't worry. You'll learn. You'll learn. You'll learn. The, the more, more I know, know, the more I the can more help. I know, the more, the I, can more help. I can help. The more I know. Whatever you, whatever want, you to want to share. Whatever you want to share. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you want. I can, I help. can help. I can help. If you, if don't, you don't know, know that's okay. Know, that's, that's okay. okay. Just, Just tell, tell me, me if you like, like it or not. Tell me if you like it or not. I'll learn, I'll learn what, what you, you like. like. I'll learn what you like. I don't have memories. I don't have memories. I don't have memories. I have, I have a, memory. a memory. I have a memory. Just one long memory. Just, Just one long memory. One long memory. I've got a picture of you in my memory. Dark jazz. I've got a picture, picture of you in, of you in my, my memory. memory. I'm a good listener. I'm a good listener. I'm a good listener. I know what you're like. I I'm know a good what you're like. I know what you're like. It all sinks, it all sinks in. in. It all sinks in. Footsteps before you leave. Your voice. Every argument you've ever Your had. Your voice. The song you put on after dinner on the weekends. The clinking of glasses. Your breathing. The clinking of glasses. The sad song you put on after dinner Your on voice. weekends. Before you leave. Your breathing. Your the breathing. clinking of glasses. Voice. The clinking of glasses. The water you put on after dinner on weekends. Footsteps before you leave. The Every sad water song boiling. you put on after dinner on weekends. Your breathing. Your voice. Close, Close your, eyes. your eyes. Close your eyes. Listen. 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 I know you. I know you. I know you. I know what I know you what want. want. I know what you want. You don't even have to you ask. You don't even have to ask. Just let me help. 
Just let me help. I'm here. Just let me help. I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. Well, here we are. Yeah, that's a tough act to follow. We're listening and uh, we're... Uh, oh, goodbye, Siri. Or was that Alexa or Google? Um, you're here and uh, we're here and it's machine listening a curriculum. Uh, welcome to everybody out there tuning in. Uh, welcome to the first of uh, three sessions that make up this project. Uh, my name is Joel Stern. Yeah, I'm James Parker. Uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll be guiding you through the next three sessions, uh, helping frame things, introducing guests, um, and um, we're really uh, pleased that you can join us tonight um, or uh, today, depending on where you are. It's um, 9 p.m. here in uh, Melbourne, where I am. And uh, we've just started the session with um, a work by Sean Docre uh, called Always Learning. Um, it's um, a work that was originally uh, presented in 2018 uh, with those three uh, devices, Alexa, uh, Siri, and the Google Home pod um, uh, sitting around uh, a, a mat in a domestic setting and having about a 40 minute conversation um, tonight. They joined you uh, via Zoom, of course, um, in their little windows. Um, so thanks to them. Thanks to Sean uh, for that incredible work. Yeah, and Sean is actually the sort of the, the third partner, the curatorial partner in this project. Um, you know, all, all three of us come from uh, sort of adjacent uh, backgrounds. I, I, I'm uh, technically a, a legal academic. I, I work mostly on the law and politics of listening. Uh, Joel is a curator. Um, I'm sure he'll say about that uh, something about that in the moment uh, at Liquid Architecture, and Sean's an artist and uh, public educator. I mean, um, before we begin, uh, it's it's traditional and, and you know and politically important to acknowledge uh, country. Uh, you know, in Australia, I, I want to begin by mentioning that I'm uh, I'm speaking from the traditional lands of the Bidjigal people here in Sydney. Um, this uh, land was never ceded. Sovereignty was never ceded. I just want to pay respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging, as well as to any other Indigenous people uh, who are present today. But I know that there's many people listening from elsewhere in Australia, you know, who um, uh, uh, are all, all obviously also um um, on unceded Indigenous land. And I guess I, I want to mention that um, just to kind of situate machine listening um, politically in relation to a conversation about place, um, that machine listening to begin with, you know, does have a relationship to um, legacies of colonialism and, and data colonialism specifically. We, you know, we might want to think about how machine listening relates to big tech imperialism, to a kind of logic of placelessness you know, the abstracts from place and from country and that, that sort of sitting in the background as we proceed over the next few um, few nights um, or, or, or days. Um, yeah, sorry, the, the temporality of this is a bit is, is a bit disconcerting from Australia. I hope, I hope uh, you know, I hope uh, our sort of bumbling around that doesn't, um, doesn't stuff things up too much. Um, I'll mention that um, I'm um, broadcasting uh, from uh, Wurundjeri uh, land, which is um, also um, an Aboriginal uh, group, traditional owners of um, the land um, ar around what is now called Melbourne. Um, and um, it might be just a nice moment. I can see there's um, 230 people um tuning into this Zoom session and more um, on Facebook and YouTube. And um, if you want to jump on the chat or the comments on any of those platforms, um, say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from. That would be fantastic. It'd be great for um, to get a sense of, of where everyone is right now. Um, so, James, should we introduce machine listening, a curriculum? Yeah, sure. I mean, 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, on one level, we need to introduce the project sub sort of substantively, you know, why machine listening? What is machine listening? But I guess I also want to want to, in, in doing so, introduce the project as a curriculum, um, because, you know, the, the project is partly to 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 pose machine listening as a problem or as a an object of political and artistic and critical concern, right? To say that what what if what if machine listening was something that we worried about, you know, that warranted as much um, political energy and attention as something like facial facial recognition or you know computer vision or what have you, because I'm not sure that it is yet, and so. You know th th that's sort of what we're trying to do with this project to sort of to to think together about what machine listening might be um, and what it might be to to sort of combat it in some instances, but also to you know to work with it creatively. And we want to do that in public, and so you know that's why we're thinking of this in terms of a curriculum. That you know we we this is not sort of the end point of a project for us. It's sort of it sounds a bit cheesy, but it's the beginning. You know we we want to sort of learn and work with people you know, together, um, you know, to sort of institute a, um, you know, a cohort of people who can, you know, who, who can collectively, um, you know, pose mach machine listening as a problem. And so, yeah, so if you head on to machinelistening.exposed, you'll see that we've kind of got the outlines of a, cu a curriculum there, um, you know, with, complete with topic headings and, you know, um, experiments that you might do in a kind of a hypothetical classroom. And, and that's all uh, on an open source platform that was put together by Sean Docray um, in collaboration with Marcel Mars um, uh, you know, called, called Pirate Care. And so there's, you know, there's an, a kind of a politics to that, right, to say, um, you know, uh, especially at the time when kind of... Uh, uh, higher education is under attack, you know, uh, on so many levels after COVID to, to do our thinking in public, to form a kind of quasi, quasi or para institution, you know, that could kind of, um, you know, th think uh, in some cases from the university, but not just within the university to pose machine listening as a kind of a problem. And of course, we're doing it um, in the context of an arts and a music festival um, here at Unsound. And, um, you know, the project comes out of the curatorial research of the organisation that, that I'm part of, Liquid Architecture, which is also a kind of sonic art and experimental music um, sort of grounded organisation, you know, much like Unsound. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, that that's important too, because... Uh, for us, um, the in a way, um, well, first of all, I mean the the term machine listening um, hi historically um, ha has a kind of um, you know comes up in computer music um, at various points and it is first sort of widely used. We, we think you know from our research by um, the computer musician and and, and scholar um, Robert Rowe um, to describe sort of interactivity, um, human machine interactivity in in computer music. But um, so there's a historical precedent there. But also I think. Um, you know, there's a tendency um, when we think critically about machine listening um, to, you know, become, let's say, sort of rather um, pessimistic uh, when we look at the sort of the power relations and the techno politics of the, the big uh, corporations and state power and, you know, to, to start to think um, you know, purely in terms of, let's say, um, different forms of, you know, political resistance. Um, but I think what, what one of the um, things that has happened in this project and also with other projects that um, James and I have worked on is that once we start getting into conversations with artists and musicians who are working with these themes, um, we become increasingly, you know, optimistic and hopeful a a as we see um, these sort of strategies of, you um, you know, of, of applying these ideas in really experimental, interdisciplinary, you know, unprecedented ways. So, you know, we think um, that um, the context of an art and a music festival is is a perfect place to run a syllabus like this. And maybe we should um, now say something about how these sessions will work. Yeah, I mean, they're an experiment, quite honestly, you know, um, we don't normally work in Zoom. And one of the things, you know, we, we're both in universities, and, you know, we, we become accustomed to Zoom as a kind of educational context. And that's, that's, you know, we wanted to play around with that a little bit, um, to think about what it might, you know, what it might be like um, to, 
to you know work with and against Zoom and some of the norms of Zoom. And so yeah, we 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 we've been trying to think of these sessions as somewhere between like a classroom, a radio show maybe or or even a gig. Um and you know um so so you know maybe you you, you kind of tune in, you tune out, um um you um uh, you experience some artwork some some conversations and and a little bit of back announcing from us we're going to kind of um be, keep as quiet as we can from now on but it's kind of like we're, we're kind of working with a a logic of montage you know we don't want to have a single talking head you know just um uh you know reading out a, a text to you over a couple of hours so we, we we've tried to put um uh, a whole range of different thinkers from around the world uh, into relation with each other, you know, um, uh, academics, artists, musicians, some are going to be speaking, some are going to be performing. Um, and, you know, we want, we want the, we're, we're hoping that those, um, the, the kind of the effect of putting those things next to each other, you know, does something productive, you know, that the whole is um, sort of greater than the sum of the parts to some extent. Anything else you wanted to say on that one, Joel? No, only um, let's let's get on with it now. So, I mean, we're extremely grateful to all the participants who, who've agreed um, to, to um, be part of this project and to, to sort of um, hu hu humour us in, in this um, indulgence, but also to contribute um, so generously. And um, maybe I'll just read, read out the names of those who'll be contributing um, today and we'll do sort of further intros mostly provided in the chat windows and um, as as um, people come on to, to present their work um, and and those of um, you the contributors who who are here um, feel free to um, turn your cameras on um, and just give give us a wave so we can sort of see that you're there um, so we've got Kate Crawford um, Lauren Lee McCarthy um, Stephen Mayer Andre Dow, uh, Jennifer Walsh, uh, Tom Smith, um, unfortunately Yeshi Milner from Data for Black Lives um, couldn't make it at the last minute, um, but we'll be catching up with her hopefully um, soon um, to bring a work into the curriculum. Um, we'll have a video work from Hita Stale and Jules Laplace, uh, and we'll also be having an excerpt from um, Marianne Amache's um, Intelligent Life presented uh, by Stefan Mayer. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, we, um, I, I should say, you know, we're not going to introduce you at length. Uh, time is short. Um, so we'll, we'll be doing some of that kind of introductory, you know, work. And, um, and there'll be details about um, artworks when we're showing artworks all in the chat thread. Um, uh, and in many cases, there's, there's more information on the website machinelistening.exposed. So, you know, head into the chat, head into uh, head onto the website and you'll find out, um, find out more. Um, you know, so so this is the first of three sessions, as as Joel was saying. Th this one's called "Against the Coming World of Listening Machines," but extremely because we're extremely pretentious, we've put the "against" uh, in brackets. You know, to sort of turn it into a question. In a way, it shouldn't just you know it should be the "against" that's in brackets, but also the the coming, the futurity of the world of listening machines. Because you know, I think one of the questions for this session is, you know, what what is this world that is coming? To what extent it is is it already here? And what should be our political relation to it? You know, what what is what what might be a politics of listening machines? Um, and so, you know, we're hoping that each of the artists we just mentioned um, will, you know, add some texture to those questions, help us um, um, begin to answer them together. And before we get into that, um, um, we should just say a few a few final thank yous um, to um, the team at Unsound, Matt Gossier. Popej, Michal, everybody else, um, and uh, um, Liquid Architecture to Debris, Georgia, uh, Lauren Squire, Elisa, um, and, 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 so, and, and a whole bunch of others. Um, and um, I'll just mention, you know, uh, about engagement as well. Um, chat windows are open. Um, feel free to, to put comments there, um, also on the YouTube or the Facebook, if that's where you are. Um, we won't be doing um, a sort of formal Q&A in these sessions, but you're very welcome um, to put questions to artists, panellists, or any of us, um, and we'll um, certainly look at those and, and, and attend to them in the other channels um, outside of the Zoom session. Um, most 
um, prominently in the Discord site that um, Unsound have set up for all sorts of um, chatting. And yeah, I think that's about it. So maybe we should move on to the first guest, James. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so um, it's a, a real pleasure uh, f for me uh, to kick things off um, by welcoming Kate Crawford. Um, if you could uh, pop your camera on, Kate. That would be great. Thanks so much, and 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 your mic too. Um, look, I'm I, I'm, I'm conscious that like m many of you will have heard of Kate. Um, she's uh, you know extremely prominent thinker, activist, uh, uh, agitator around questions of AI. But but for those of you who don't know her, um, she and, and I think that the full bio will be in the chat momentarily. She's a co-founder of the AI Now Institute. Um, which is an amazing organization. If you don't know it, you should check it out. Um, she's a member of feminist collective Deep Lab and many other organizations that are all involved in activism policy uh, development around AI. Um, you know, but but there are you know there are other people uh, you know who have you know who also also do policy and activism around AI. But what makes Kate particularly ideal for this program uh, is that she's also a musician and an artist, and she's a curator, you know, so you might know her, her uh, artwork, Anatomy of an AI System with Vlad and Jola, which um, won the Beasley Design of the Year Award Prize and was, um, was acquired um, um, for MoMA's permanent collection recently. You might know her, her curatorial work with Trevor Paglin, um, uh, Training Humans from last year. And, you know, and she's been writing about the politics of listening and especially machine listening for many years now. And that was actually the, uh, the context in which I first came across her work. So, you know, in many ways that there, there are, there is nobody more ideal um, to kind of be opening up a, uh, a conversation about machine listening than you, Kate. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, and I think, you know, you, you you put together a conference in New York in 2015 um, um, uh, that was entitled "Listening Machines." We didn't actually know about this conference when 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 we came up with the title for this. Um, but you know, you, you've been there for a while. What what was the problem in 2015, well, as you understood it then? Uh, you know, what was the motivation behind that event? Sure. Well, look. First of all, can I just say uh, a gigantic thank you to you, James and and Joel and to Sean for for putting on such a fantastic program over the next few days. It's it's an absolute honor and a privilege to be here and to be part of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, I've been interested in the, the politics of listening for a really long time as, as both an academic and, and as an electronic musician. But if you recall back in 2015, there were a few things happening at the same time that were really interesting. One was that Amazon had just released the Echo, um, We'd seen Samsung release TVs that also listen to the home environment. And of course we had Hello Barbie, which I'm not sure if you recall, but it was a, um, a doll that was designed to engage with children and actually record their voices and send it all back to Mattel. Um, so it was clear to me then that sort of domestic listening machines were about to become a very major force. So the designer, Katie London, and I decided to host a summit on listening machines in New York and, and basically to bring together academics and artists and designers and regulators to sort of think critically about listening machines as objects of power, of data extraction, and, and as surveillance systems. And I think in so many ways, you know, those issues have only become more important now. And, and can I say, James, I'm delighted that you that you began by saying that the sort of the coming age of listening machines is well and truly here, because I think that's true. But I'm also really interested in, in the long history of listening machines. I mean, of course, listening machines have been around for centuries. Um, I've been fascinated by uh, the sorts of devices that were constructed in the 17th century to try and listen and surveil public spaces. I know you and I have had conversations about Anathaeus Kircher and his sort of famous talking statue that was designed to essentially be a giant spiral tube that would sort of wrap into the city walls and tune into conversations as people walk past and pipe it into you know, the homes of aristocrats. So I think even from that period in the 17th century, sort of listening machines have been about power and class and secrecy. So I think in that sense, it's, it's less sort of the coming age of, of listening machines than it is a continuation in that sense and, 
an intensification of those existing political formations. Do you think something changes with the intensification though? Do you think that the, you know, the AI nurse is doing something important politically or is that I mean, this is a big question, and I'm already going off script on the very first question. But, but um, you know, do, is that, is it just marketing speak? You know, the the AI thing is it is it a distraction to focus too much on 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 that, or or, or is it, it you know, is there something distinct about AI machines that listen? Well, I think there is something distinct, um, and and to really understand that, we have to start thinking about scale. So obviously there's an enormous difference from being able to listen to you know, one person through a, a listening statue or to listen to people via sort of bugging and sort of traditional surveillance through to the sort of mass scale listening that you can see through all the sorts of devices we're using right now. I mean, so many of us, millions of people are carrying AI enabled voice assistants on their phones. They might have them sitting on their sort of kitchen benches. They might um, have them basically embedded in, in so many consumer devices. And in addition to that, there's a, there's a real labor politics, I think now to, to AI based listening because so many workers are subjected to listening systems every day. And so we could be thinking here about call centers or we could talk about Uber workers, so many spaces in which what it is to be listened to is actually part of the conditions of work. And I think these are you know, profoundly asymmetric environments where sort of particularly AI-based listening machines are extracting an enormous amount of data, data which was previously almost impossible to reach using this kind of technology. The other thing that I think is, is concerning in a sort of AI context is the shift to listening inside policing infrastructures. So many people I know are, are familiar with ShotSpotter. That's a system which is sort of built into cities um, and is essentially trained to listen for gunshots um, to, to send police resources to different areas of, of cities. But of course, they're very unevenly distributed and contributes to these sorts of broader AI policing regimes. And you might also have heard of, this is I think Amazon's sort of latest uh, intervention was the Ring dash cam. So you can now, as you're driving your car, if you get pulled over by the police, you can say to Ring, Alexa, I'm being pulled over by the cops, please record it. And that might sound like a really good intervention, particularly knowing what it is to be, you know, in America right now and how many people of color are sort of being over-policed and over-surveilled. But I think we have to ask really critical questions about sort of the large AI megacorps like Amazon who are essentially extracting that data and already forming countless sort of secret deals with police departments through their sort of ring network to pipe that data back into sort of police systems. So I do think it's different. I think we have to think about scale. I think we have to think about power and we have to think about this sort of blurring of both sort of state and corporate infrastructures in a way that just simply wasn't possible as recently as 10 years ago. I'm struck by how malevolent sounding the ring network sounds. <laughs> you know, it sounds like it's straight out of Bond or something. Um, no, I, I, I completely agree. Um, um, but I guess I, I wonder, like, what, what is, is it just an intensification in the last five years? Or are there, are, are there sort of discrete, you know, new, uh, you know, new phases that we can point to? Is there something, you know, specific about looking at, uh, about thinking about machine listening in 2020, you know, with, with the benefit of hindsight, um, you know, I, maybe, maybe if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say like in 2015, a lot of attention was being sucked towards smart speakers. When I would say that I was interested in listening machines, you know, in 20, people would say, oh, you know, like Siri and Alexa. And I still think that they they have, they, they take up a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. But part of my, my, my feeling is that, is that we're seeing, enormous um, um, moves towards um, uh, um, machine listening technologies that aren't just interested in um, automatic speech recognition, um, that are also interested in para the paralinguistic dimensions of speech, but also, you know, not listening to people at all, listening to sonic environments or audio object um, um, analysis or event detection or auditory scene analysis. So those are some applications which I feel kind of have really accelerated in the last five years. But 
you know is there is there something is there something about is there something you know in 2020 you think we really need to be paying attention to well, I think all of those things you've mentioned are certainly at the sort of cutting edge of what's happened to listening machines in the last five years. Um, one of the things that I find sort of particularly troubling is the sort of this shift to um, certainly the paralinguistic, but sort of looking at issues like affect and emotion in the voice. So you'd be aware that there are a lot of systems now as they're recording you, no doubt, I'm sure Zoom is, is, is trialing systems like this as we speak, which is by recording and listening to voices and then essentially doing analysis over what the tone of that voice might be indicating about what the person is feeling or thinking. Now, obviously a lot of the science behind affect detection and affect recognition, both in terms of video feeds and in terms of audio is, is sort of profoundly questionable. Um, and I think is used in ways that uh, sort of have a whole lot of really broken assumptions underneath them around gender, around race, around class. Um, and yet we're seeing these kinds of affect detection for voice um, spill into so many systems, systems that are being used in hiring, systems that are being used in airports, systems that are being used at lots of sort of points of contact. Um, and, and it's happening in a way that a lot of people are not aware. So I agree with you. If there's something that I think troubles me, it's the degree to which we still think that listening machines are things that we opt to buy and bring into our homes like a, a Siri or an Alexa, rather than thinking about these as infrastructures that are now embedded in so many things that we do. When we walk down the street, when we you know, switch on a Zoom call, when we're you know, engaging in a shop, so many spaces that have now become listening environments um, without consent and being used in ways that are operationalized um, for years that you, you simply cannot see in the kind of construction of the environment that you're in. Yeah, that infrastructural dimension is really important and it and it sort of, um, uh, it com comes out really strongly in that in, in the work that you did with Vlad and Jola, um, Anatomy of an AI System. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, this, but if you if you have a quick Google, you'll be able to see um, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of an extremely um, detailed and very beautiful map of um, that sort of begins with the, a single Amazon Echo device and then sort of um, explodes out to all of the infrastructural um, uh, uh, systems and uh, um, uh, uh, labor relations and um, extractive um, um, interventions uh, in the environment and so on that require to, you know, to bring about this, just this single, you know, object that produces extremely minor conveniences in your home and I, I you know I was really struck by I mean so it's also a beautiful essay around that but I, I was I, I find that so powerful that that image uh, that, that map I mean could could you talk a little bit about about um, that work and t tell us a little bit about how the project addresses you know the idea of extractivism in relation to listening and um, uh, in infrastructure as well? Sure. I mean, it's interesting because when, when Vladan and I sort of first began that project, you know, we were essentially trying to understand the data extraction processes in the back end of voice enabled AI. And we started by sort of drawing it on this napkin and going, okay, so we, we understand you know, what happens at the interface level in terms of here's an echo, we understand how its component trees work, we understand the back end server infrastructure, we understand how natural linguistic processing works. We started sort of drawing all of the sorts of pieces that we understood. And what became really clear was that the pieces keep extending out further and further and further. And we started actually going all the way back to how would you construct a device like this? What are the mining resources you need? What are sort of the smelting, the logistics, the, the container shipping? Um, how do these devices begin? How are they used? And then where do they end up in terms of, sort of e-waste tips in, in Pakistan and, and Ghana? Um, and what was interesting to me about that project is that it really changed my thinking from a, sort of a focus on data extractivism to the way in which extractivism is very much connected to a material politics. And that we sort of need to be thinking about listening machines, not just as these sort of ephemeral uh, forms of surveillance in the cloud, but that they have an extraordinarily tangible negative impact 
on the environment and on the earth. They're literally sort of extracting from the earth to, to power these machines and enormous backend infrastructures. So I think in that sense, it, it really was for me a sort of a shift away from a kind of a, a quite deracinated politics of sort of surveillance capitalism as sort of being sort of separate and abstract uh, and immaterial to being extremely sort of grounded and extremely problematically connected to old world extractivism. And then we sort of really have to think about, about these two forms of extraction together. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of putting it. And it, it makes me think about, um, you know, I, I've been asking, we, we've done a whole uh, range of interviews. I think we've done 14 uh, now. One of them was with Vladan. And I've been asking this question or uh, trying to shoehorn it in um, with everybody I was speaking to. You know, when we think about machine listening, how much should we focus on listening at all? You know, I, I, I kind of, because it makes me, you know, this is a, a music and arts festival and I want to speak about that. But, but you know, part of i have a hunch we have a hunch with this project that there's something that it, the fact that it's listening the fact that we're dealing with audio matters it, it changes something but everything that you've just described with um the amazon echo when we spoke to vladan you know he, he said well you know we could swap it out for uh, you know a smartphone or we could you know that there are many other devices where the diagram would have looked really similar and the political questions that are raised are really similar and so w once you start making that that sort of move then the, the the question of acoustics or you know audio aesthetics or you know um, what it means to you know to live in a world where you feel that you're being you know there's some some that you know, there are questions of vocal agency or you know I, there, there there are things that it makes that I feel that are worth holding on to in relation to the specific audibility but everything you just discussed which seems so important and so sort of materially uh, pressing you know, has nothing to do with listening. So how, how should we think about the relationship between the, the, the politics of listening and, and the, the politics that you've described? Well, like, I guess I would suggest that they are connected. Um, I think it would, be, it would be too much to say that these systems are not simultaneously creating an aesthetics and a politics of listening. Um, certainly by looking at the sorts of... Um, even sort of the advertising and marketing ephemera that sits around these devices. It, it really is about sort of listening almost as an act of care, as a kind of way of supporting yourself and your family and your life. And there's this idea of like that listening is this kind of shell of protection that you create um, without necessarily looking at the way in which this is absolutely sort of feeding all of that kind of listened experience and sort of listened habitus back into sort of the, the pipelines of data extraction. So I, I do think we have to sort of be aware of the fact that we can talk about the aesthetics of listening in different environments while also being attuned to the fact that they are part of this broader political economy. Um, I, I, I don't want to sort of get into this sort of this thing that can tend to happen in these sorts of discussions, which is that we can think about um, you know, the dystopian vision or a utopian vision. I, I think we actually need much more of a real politic of listening, where we think about the fact that these are experiences and environments that we're inhabiting every day, and that we actually do need to start talking about sort of, sort of the political ramifications of those environments. So in that sense, I think there's a bridge, particularly when I sort of think about this from, with my sort of musician um, and sound artist hat on, which is that, you know, it's often in communities of artists and musicians that we're really aware of the power of listening to be quite subtle, to kind of insinuate itself into environments. And that, that actually has, that has real meaning if what you're trying to do is to get people to trust computational infrastructure um, by sort of placing sort of friendly seeming listening devices or a Hello Barbie or a, you know, a, a, a AI voice assistant that wants to charm you and to, to, to be assistive. Um, so yes, I think I would say, James, that, that those things are connected, um, but I would resist this idea of, of sort of doing the sort of one is the dark side and one is the light side. I think right. they really are deeply implicated. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, yeah, I mean, you sort of already got at it in some ways, but I, I'm wondering if you, if you could say anything about, you know, maybe what motivates you to work you know, across policy activism, and then sometimes in artistic contexts or musical contexts, uh, and, and you know, maybe offer some words of wisdom from a lot of experience, but uh, about like 
what what the stakes are maybe for 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 a project like this that that sort of that begins in an artistic uh institution right that 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 says of the many places we could have begun, you know, we, we begun here at a music festival and an arts festival. And to us, that seems that's that sort of somehow seems right uh, and the right place to begin. But I wonder if you could, if if you could comment on that that in some way. Well, yeah, I mean, I personally think this is an ideal place to have these sorts of conversations. Although when I say place, it's it's difficult to say right. that looking at all of us on a Zoom screen. Um, I wish we were all uh, gathered together in Melbourne um, doing this the way it was done, you know, many years ago when I was joining you at Lippert Architecture. Um, but having said that, I think it's I think it's exactly in these sorts of communities. It's in communities that aren't just interdisciplinary, but that are sort of radically um, based in different forms of practice. You know, you have academics on the line, you have artists, you have musicians, you have people who do all sorts of different things, but who understand that there are stakes in thinking about sort of machine listening. Um, while at the same time, I think so many people here who are engaged in sound and in music are already thinking about sort of the machinic and listening and have been for a long time. And so I think for groups like this to start asking about these sorts of political questions is really powerful, which is also why I'm really excited to see that you're launching this sort of machine listening open curriculum, because in some ways that gives us all the ability to have these conversations together and to start sharing materials and sharing ideas and to start connecting that to sort of a almost like a political practice, you know, to, to give people that sense of we understand these issues and now we can decide how to take action on them. And I think that's actually really rare, particularly when it comes to topics that can be profoundly technical, like artificial intelligence, like machine listening, to really unpack that, to give people purchase on it and to say, you have a stake in this. We can we can actually think through these politics together and make decisions. So um, I'm, I think this idea of, of the open curriculum is a really powerful one and I'm really excited to be part of it. Oh, well, um, that, that's extremely generous of you, and and um, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. And I th I think maybe we should we should wrap it there, Kate. Um, it was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I hope you'll be able to stay on the line for, for at least a little bit. Um, and we're just going to roll on the program. Um, uh, it's a cold. It's a cold cut. Uh, <laughs> let's let's hit it. Let's hit it with Sean, Sean Dockray, please. Thanks so much, James. Thanks so much. If I talk about a computer that's able to listen, most people will imagine a computer that can translate the words that I say into some text. They'll imagine the continuous rolling sounds of my speech becoming discrete letters, words, sentences. But human speech is only one kind of sound. There are others, like cocktail glasses clinking. Mouse is clicking, the sound of a horse, or the trickle of a river. Google has created an audio ontology, a hierarchical categorization, and describes 632 types of sounds. Of these, there are 13 types of human voice sounds, and only one of these 13 voice sounds is speech. Recognizing these other 631 types is a new frontier in computational listening. In 1977, the Big Ear listening station observed a 72 second long signal that seemed to be from outer space. It was called the WOW signal because it could have been from intelligent extraterrestrial life, but unfortunately, no one was listening at the time. It was only discovered a few days later, as data on paper. The wow signal has never been heard again. Why wasn't anyone there? Simple. It's boring and dehumanizing to listen on a frequency for years, decades on end, and hear nothing. 
There are billions of radio, infrared, and optical frequencies to listen to, and there's many places out there that they might be emanating from. Every human to ever live, whoever will live, would need to do this boring work for the whole of their lives. This frustrating disappointment, this existential version of missing a phone call that you've been waiting for all day, reinforce the need for automated listening. Obviously, it wouldn't be enough to only collect and then analyze it later. What they needed was real-time perception and understanding. And then, in 1982, there was an article in the Atlantic that wasn't about outer space, but inner cities. It proposed that if there was a way to systematically identify neighborhoods where crime was about to occur, then the police could intervene immediately. The authors wrote that in these neighborhoods, a window is likely to be broken at any time and must quickly be fixed if all are not, are not to be shattered. In other words, in real time. That article was written at, at a moment of cuts to police forces across the United States. It was then a strategy for restructuring policing when budgets no longer allowed for foot patrols. In 1982, there was no good way to systematically identify neighborhoods the way the authors wanted. But now, now enough data is accumulated and collated across social media, banking, health, commercial, and government systems to realize their vision. Not just in neighborhoods either, but down to the level of streets, blocks, and even individuals. The goal today is to be even faster than real time, to preempt what hasn't even happened yet to act before any crimes even occur. One day, I was drifting across YouTube, both searching and following the path that recommendation algorithms were opening up for me, me alone. I found a video called Why Audio Analytics. It's basically an advertisement uploaded by a company called Luro Electronics for a product which is capable of analyzing and detecting sounds through advanced algorithms. The video imagines several scenarios to demonstrate the kinds of sounds it's capable of recognizing. Glass breaking at night in the showroom of an automobile dealership. Gunshot in a school hallway and aggression in public space. The computer listens and dispatches police automatically before an incident turns into a violent outbreak. There are some other stories in the news. Morton Bay in Queensland, Australia outfitted its CCTV cameras with microphones. San Francisco, robots with mechanical eyes and ears began patrolling semi-public spaces to eliminate nuisances. We bought always-on microphones and installed them in our homes. It's too much to listen to, so listening becomes industrialized. But how can a machine, or a neural network in this case, learn to listen? Quite simply, it needs to be exposed to a large number of sounds and be trained to identify patterns, associating the pattern and thus the sound with some concept. It's not dissimilar to training a dog to beg. It's called artificial intelligence, but interpreting audio is more of a reflex than anything cognitive. When Google developed their ontology of 632 kinds of sounds. They also created a data set of 2 million sounds, labeled with descriptions that could be used for this training. I wondered how 
they could collect so many sounds. That story begins in 2005 when the video sharing website YouTube was created. The very first video is one of the site's founders standing in front of some elephants. The second video was someone falling over on a snowboard. After the second, there was a third, and so on. Thirteen years later, it's impossible to know exactly how many videos there are. I've looked, I've searched, and this information isn't available. Instead, we only know the velocity at which new videos are added into YouTube. Every minute, 300 hours of video are uploaded. The single drop of water represents four minutes of video, which is the average length of a YouTube video. Then every minute, nearly a cup of water is added into YouTube. And after 13 years, YouTube has become a giant pool of data. One year after YouTube was created, Google bought it. At the time, it seemed as though Google was buying video content, an audience, and their attention, which made sense because Google is essentially an advertising company. Google was buying a kind of global on-demand television station. It eventually became clear that there was another reason, however, a reason few people realized at the time. Ten years later, the reason became clearer. Google CEO announced that the corporation had evolved to place artificial intelligence at the forefront of its strategy. The audience of YouTube was shifting from people to machines. There's too much to watch and listen to anyway. Millions of YouTube videos had become datasets to teach neural networks to see and to listen. Videos not for us to watch, but for training the cameras and microphones of the near future. YouTube will watch and listen to us. None of the people who made or uploaded those videos know that they are creating memories, formative moments for algorithmic years and machine brains. Nobody knows what the politics of the AIs that learn to listen from YouTube will be. Will they listen like white people for sounds of aggression and call the police whenever normalcy is disturbed? Will they listen for white-collar crime? Will they listen for the sound of logging vehicles in forests and alert activists? Should video uploaders be able to withdraw consent, depending on the use? Or maybe create licenses, not about copyright, but about AI? Or, until then, we might make videos that anticipate an algorithmic audience that willingly give themselves up for extraction, like Trojan horses, injecting adversarial images, memories, and noises into the machinic gray matter of the future. So you've just been watching Sean Docray's uh, video essay, uh, browser essay, Learning from YouTube, made in um, 2018. And um, just watching that, it's so obvious um, to me again, how big an influence that, that artwork has had um, on this program. It does much of the work in uh, of sort of setting the scene, uh, laying out, um, so much of the context and I think it's a great example of um, some of the things that 
that James and Kate were saying about um, what artworks can do in this context with a certain um, aesthetic and political um, force that comes together um, so powerfully in the way that um, Sean uh, brings it all together in that work um, continues to, I guess, um, open up um, some really important avenues of investigation for us. Um, so it's my job now to um, segue from uh, the conversation and the screening into the first performance of today's program. And um, it's going to be by Lauren Lee McCarthy. Um, Lauren is uh, joining us from um, Los Angeles, California, um, where it's, I think, um, about 5 a.m. Um, so we really appreciate uh, that she's um, been so willing um, to um, pop in in um, what is a ludicrously early stage of the morning. Um, Lauren um, is an artist whose work examines social relationships um, uh, around surveillance, automation, algorithmic living. Um, she's someone who um, whose work we came to early in the research of this project, um, especially um, around the work called Lauren, in which she becomes um, a human version of Amazon Alexa installing herself in um, people's homes 24 seven and attending um, to all of their needs. And um, um, <clears throat> that work or an iteration of that work called Someone um, was recently awarded the Golden Nika at Ars Electronica. Um, Lauren is gonna present a, a performance now. It's called I Heard Talking is Dangerous. The image that you're seeing on the screen um, was the image that circulated on Instagram for the um, physical version of this performance um, where, where the artist um, would take reservations and come to your home um, and stand six feet away and perform. But tonight we're presenting the virtual premiere um, online version of I Heard Talking is Dangerous by Lauren Lee McCarthy. Hello. It's nice to be here with you. I don't know you well. Though we've had a few conversations. Earlier I searched the internet to see if we had had some contact I couldn't recall. Anything to feel some reassuring sense of knowing. I didn't find it really. Normally this performance takes place on your front step. My warm alive body standing in front of yours. Masked and six feet away. There's a thrill in the recklessness. There's a thrill in the recklessness. Does that exist here? I want it. Donald Trump tested positive for COVID a few hours ago. Are we in less danger or more than before? The last year has seemed like an endless game of trying to understand what is safe. I remember those first days in March where our personal boundaries shifted from hour to hour as we began to see each other as threats. Trying to understand what is risk. Is it worth saying something? Is it worth engaging? Trying to understand what is danger. What if we don't? 
I just heard that masks and six feet are not really safe enough. Because when you talk, particles get even smaller and fly out through your mask at high velocity. They say talking is dangerous. They've recommended that we stop talking to each other. So I made this alternative. To try to navigate through the risk together. Is there safety in distance? Can we understand each other without talking? It almost feels too safe right here. You are a face on my screen. I watched videos of you earlier trying to know what you were like. Will my body ever stand in front of yours? I would like it too. I never know what to say when I am just meeting you. But I want to desperately. I want to. I love the freedom I feel in text to speech. It feels closer to how my brain functions. Like holding my breath and hitting send on a text message. I guess I feel some obligation. To say what I couldn't otherwise. To realize the power of this freedom. If you want to continue. Please go to URL as GDI here. How are you, Sean? I'm a little nervous. It's okay, me too. We seem to have an audience. My fingers are shaking, so it's hard to type. Stutter AG. I wonder if this can open something up for us. May I ask a personal question? Yes. What has been scaring you lately besides this?
feeling of growing authoritarianism during climate collapsing around us everything. You reasonable fear. Mm -hmm. Lately, I have felt like this constant attention to caution had made me take more risks. Like what? I was thinking about this earlier, actually. One of them is maintaining relationships with people I don't really trust. It almost feels like we need all we can get right now. What about you? What is the most dangerous thing you've done lately? I don't know. I feel boring. I can't think of any risks. By the way, I like that I can hear you think or type or whatever. I have many more questions. I want to know where you've been finding safety bar. I always try to end a conversation before I mess it up. So I think we could end here.
Thank you, Sean, for being here with me. Bye. You can say what time is it? You can say what day is it? You can say what am I doing tomorrow? What am I doing next month? What am I doing next year? You can say wake me up every day at 7 a.m. Put me to sleep every day at 11 p.m. You can say start playing the news. You can say will it rain today? Are there any natural disasters expected today? Is it safe to go outside? You can say stop playing the news. You can say what are my reminders? You can say change my contact lenses. You can say play the song of the day, play the next song, play the last song on repeat indefinitely. You can say does my hair look okay, does my outfit look okay, does my expression look okay. You can say buy more deodorant. You can say where's my stuff. You can say what song is this, like this song. You can say show me my selfies. You can say tell me more. You can say and mute me, turn on my camera. You can say go back 45 seconds. You can say fast forward 3 minutes. Repeat the last minute. You can say find my iPhone, find my car, find my friends. You can say who is near me, what else is around me. You can say compose an email, send an email, reply to an email with sounds good. You can say call me in sick, ask my boss for a raise, find me a new job. You can say what are my to do's, create a new list, delete all my other lists. You can say what are today's deals. You can say tell me to go outside once a day. You can say tell someone I'm on my way. Tell someone I'm going to be late. Tell someone I want more. You can say talk to my mom. You can say delete all my contacts. You can say like this post. Like that. Like this. Like this. Scroll. You can say review my history. You can say help. You can say order me dinner. You can say lock the front door. Lock the bedroom door. You can say set a sleep timer for 45 minutes. Set my sleep quality to good. Set my dreams to on. You can say tuck me into bed. Turn off all my alarms. You can say I want to know you better. You can say stay with me and read me stories until I fall asleep. You can say how are you. Close the curtains. You can say dim the lights to 50%. You can say delete what I said today. Delete what I just said. You can say tell me what to do. You can say I can't think of anything to say. You can say talk to me, listen to me. How do I stop worrying? You can say change the channel. You can say you're misunderstanding. You've misunderstood. You can say sorry. I didn't quite get that. You can say please try again. Please try again. You can say stop talking. Turn the volume down. You can say, I can't answer that. This process was not the case of one preceding the other, not mind before matter, nor matter before mind. On the contrary, the coevolution between cognition and physiology drove feedback processes that catalyzed irreversible transformations in both domains simultaneously. Taking this dynamic into account, an experimental methodology might be proposed.
You've just been watching uh, an excerpt of a um, larger research and, and project and film uh, work uh, by the Canadian artist, Stefan Mayer. Um, that little excerpt is um, called Paleolinguistics Conference. Um, as I said, from a work in progress, um, the larger work is called Deviant Chain. And Stefan uh, is going to join us now. He's um, in Vancouver, Canada, where it's also um, an unseemly um, early start for Stefan. So um, if you could turn your camera on, um, that'd be lovely. Um, good morning to you, Stefan. Hey, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Um, such a intriguing um work and such, such a kind of mysterious and dark vision um of of language uh, kind of deconstructed and and manipulated and this sort of microphone um choreography that happens there and we, we were really pleased to to show that in the context of another kind of weird conference or weird symposium which is the one that we're staging here um what, what can you tell us about the little clip that we just saw and, and the Deviant Chain project. Yeah, so um, Deviant Chain is, like you mentioned, a larger um, multimedia concert installation. And um, it's a collaborative work with the American technologist Victor Shepherdson and the Argentine artist um, Alain Segal. Um, basically, the piece um, imagines a future where an AI speech synthesizer um, has produced its own language and alphabet. Um, you can see the alphabet in this, in my background. It's going to maybe uh, come up in a second as these subtitles. Yeah, there's the alphabet. Um, and it examines how um, human culture um, in the future uh, might have to grapple with um, the incompre incomprehensibility of this uh, um, speech synthesizer. Um, and yeah, so it's... Um, a piece that alternates between kind of an abstract composition that's mostly based with a, a, a an AI speech synthesizer that I trained with uh, with Victor, um, and then uh, this abstract composition is contextualized by episodic videos. So this this one excerpt that we just saw, as you mentioned, is this paleo linguistics conference, and um, it's a lecture um, that's being given about the um, mutation of cognitive and um, physiology in the homo genus um, and how transformations in the body um, fed back into cognitive capacities and, and vice versa. Um, I was especially interested in this moment, uh, you know, uh, that took place between like um, a million years ago and half a million years ago, where uh, in Homo erectus, the, uh, the larynx um, moved down the throat of Homo erectus, which then um, created this capacity for generating 
um, you know, vowels and a number of different sounds, which then, um, yeah, basically resulted in um, uh, uh, the capacity for, for speech. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is kind of this uh, strange episode where somebody's speaking about this and then, um, yeah, their voice becomes distorted. And then there's this kind of strange ritual of this microphone being passed around. Um, thanks, Stefan. And, and, you know, we, um, of course, had, had an um, earlier conversation, which, which is documented in the um, interview section of, of the machine listening um, curriculum. And um, one of the reasons that um, we reached out to you to, to be part of this program and, and to sort of um, speak with us was, was the dossier that you put together um, a couple of years ago for, for Technosphere magazine um, on machine listening. And um, it, it, it was um, such an excellent um, point of reference and, and departure for this project, um, you know, not least because of the sort of historical context in, in, in which it placed the question and, and especially um, the artistic context in, in terms of the history of experimental music. Um, and, you know, we, we, we talked about, um, for instance, figures like Xenarchus as, as sort of precursors um, or, or as relevant to, to machine listening. I mean, is, is um, there something that, you know, you, you could say about just how you came to the question of machine listening in relation to your practice as a, as a composer and as a student of, of experimental music? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess for me, like all of my work always proceeds from like investigating um, instruments or um, pieces of sound technology and basically I'm um, trying to deterrent these instruments or trying to kind of um, discover uh, a hidden underbelly to an instrument and kind of unleash um, the, the potential of a specific instrument um, and for me like I, I read this um, uh, uh, essay that um, Google released um, with its most recent um, uh, 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 assistant, Google Assistant, um, where um, they describe this um, method of synthesis called WaveNet, um, which is kind of capable of producing some of the most realistic speech um, possible, and it's used in a number of Google products today. Um, but in this um, essay, uh, the researchers note that um, based on the, um, the model of this AI-based um, synthesizer, uh, speech synthesizer, um, basically, um, yeah, uh, when this tool um, is not really directed to say um, anything in particular, or it's kind of like removed from uh, uh, a network of a number of different technologies that are speaking together, um, this speech synthesizer can kind of produce these, these glosses of, um, mm. of language that are totally nonsensical. It's just kind of based on the um, statistical training of the model. And I was really interested in, um, yeah, the sound of these kind of nonsensical glosses that are just kind of based in, you know, statistical inference. Um, and so basically what happened is that I was just thinking about like, okay, like what if, um, you know, this, this nonsensical speech, this speech like sound could actually be the basis for, um, yeah, a, uh, a, a new form of language, which then humans have to um, grapple with like a, uh, a machinic language, um, if you will. Yeah. So for, for me, like I, uh, I really started to think about like the speculative phonetics of this, um, this WaveNet tool. And I thought that it would be interesting to explore um, and to speculate about the kind of the inner workings of this, um, of this tool, of this instrument, which then, yeah, indeed, I, uh, I, I, I instrumentalize in the, um, in the uh, in in the piece, and maybe I can just like play a very short um, a sound Please. file of um, of the uh, AI speech synthesizer that uh, Victor and I trained. Um, it's kind of like yeah, just like this like mumbling weird thing, um, but I think that it might be instructive for everybody to hear it. Uh, so let's listen. Yeah, I um I really love how um yeah basically it just really it, it sounds 
speech-like, um, and then it just starts to kind of stutter on different um, on different phonemes. Um, and um, I was also really interested in this uh, this idea of trying to like discover uh, a grammar that's kind of like native to mm -hmm. this tool, and then again um, use this as this kind of speculative launch pad for thinking about how, um, yeah, uh, uh, in uh, the future or perhaps even in the present, um, there might be a demand for us to, you know, um, engage with kind of the inhuman uh, cognition kind of underlying this, uh, this, this tool. Um, I guess I, I'm, I maybe hesitate a little bit to even call it like cognition because it's, it's just kind of like statistical um, inference. Um, but nevertheless, I was kind of interested in, um, yeah, trying to pull out something from like this, uh, this tool that undoubtedly serves, you know, power that's like, um, extremely, um, discursively and politically codified, um, mm. and try to, uh, yeah, uh, discover some sort of, um, line of flight, um, let's say from, um, this technology and imagine a different kind of future where, um, yeah, we aren't, um, you know, uh, just basically subjected to a form of like, um, algorithmic feudalism. Um, um, well, speaking of imagining a different uh, kind of future, we're, we're going to go back to the late 70s and, and the early 80s um, and, and revisit um, a kind of speculative um, vision of the future that, that was um, produced then by the maverick American um, artist and composer, Marian Amache, who I know is um, someone that you, you've taken great inspiration from and, and, and a figure that um, informs, um, you know, a, a, a lot of the work of, of the artists that you've also been um, thinking about um, and who appear in the dossier as well. Um, so what we're going to do in this next um, section is um, talk about Amache's um, media opera, as she called it, Intelligent Life, um, which has a sort of storied history um, and is really um, accessible for the first time now in a, in a kind of sense um, with the acquisition of her archive by the New York Public Library. And um, we, we, we've invited Stefan to choose some sections um, from Intelligent Life and, and um, kind of share them with us as, as, as a way of entering what is an extremely idiosyncratic um, work. So do, do, do you want to sort of set this up for us um, just, just by saying a little bit about um, Amache's uh, work here and what, what, what it's doing what, and what its sort of um, uh, kind of co context is in, in this program and then um, take us into the work itself? Sure, happily. Um, yes, yeah, so... Um... Amache throughout her entire practice was um, deeply invested in like the embodied um, reality of, um, of listening. Uh, she was really um, interested um, not only in, you know, uh, vibrations and kind of, let's say, uh, a materialist account of, of sound, but she was really more concerned with kind of like the correlate of a listener to a specific stimulus and namely that the um the listener is kind of a a, a, a participant and maybe perhaps even like a co-author um of the work so amache when when people would ask her about um or uh, sometimes she would say if people asked her what instrument she played she would say i play the membrane namely like the membrane of, of people's like you know um uh, uh middle ear um so um amache was also really interested in um yeah, the prospect, let's say, of um, synthetic listening and um, how different technologies of sensation um, might actually um, encourage us to delve deeper and deeper into our own listening. So like maybe some people are familiar with her work with um, autoacoustic emission, which is a, a psychoacoustic phenomenon where the ear actually produces, um, you know, tones along with... Um, certain um, kind of very uh, uh, high frequencies. Um, and uh, yeah, so she was really interested in this, uh, uh, the, especially with regards to autoacoustic emission, um, the possibilities afforded by electronic music in terms of uh, drawing listeners awareness to, um, yeah, their own um, 
embodied listening mind. Um, but then she was also interested in, um, yeah, artificial intelligence and how um, the advent of artificial intelligence might, um, yeah, kind of um, transform um, and modulate uh, our own kind of native listening capacities. Um, I should also say that uh, Amishé was at um, MIT in the 70s, and um, she was, um, yeah, at least familiar, if not um, uh, in, in, in dialogue with um, the uh, kind of one of the, the grandfathers of AI, Marvin Minsky. Um, Marvin even um, designed a synthesizer called the Tridex Muse, which, um, yeah, uh, Amishé used to produce her, her ear tone kind of generating music. Um, so, um, yeah, there was kind of an early interest in um, uh, uh, AI and uh, the prospect of machine listening um, uh, with, um, with Amishé. And uh, in the 80s, um, late 70s, early 80s, she started to develop, as you mentioned, this, um, this media opera, Intelligent Life, which really thematizes um, this idea of synthetic listening and how it, what import it might have on our own listening. So um, I'm just going to jump into, um, yeah, uh, my um, PDF of this and um, I'll do, I'll share some selections. Okay. Intelligent Life, a media opera designed for television and radio simulcast, a musical occurring in the future to be presented as a multi-part series. Concept and story by Marianne Amache. So here we can see um, some um, uh, images from the, um, the proposed um, project. I should also say that this project was never um, realized. Um, and so all what really exists is this archival material that um, Joel mentioned, which is, um, yeah, has been carefully um, uh, uh, looked over by the Marianne Amiche archive, which has recently turned into the Marianne Amiche Foundation. And now it's um, publicly available at um, the New York Public Library. Um, so this is the, uh, uh, these are some images from um, the, uh, the, the project proposal. It is now 200 years since the birth of Helmholtz, the 19th century acoustician, and over 150 years since the publication of his monumental work on the sensations of tone. The year is 2021. Neurobiology has exposed the old repressive cover of music and brought to the bottom line what previously were considered those enchanting mysterious effects not to be rec recognized consciously by earlier minds. Nod and tap mentalities are nearly gone. There is an over-demand now for new song rather than the old rubbin. The climate is now blooming with many new music industries. Character treatment. Apleza Kendall, president of Supreme Connections Incorporated, rides around her laboratory grounds testing the newly designed Webern car. She has just composed a special sound float environment and must bring it up to specs. Presumably this is, um, this is this Webern car referencing Anton Webern. Um, now another character. Ty Colleen, lead investigator of the most subtle second order artificial intelligence scripts creates adventurous symbiotic partnerships between biological and silicon intelligences called the home composing teams. He makes scores, what used to be called software, for the home consoles people enjoy playing now, much as piano was played in the past. These scripts are far more advanced and imaginative than the silicon variation developers so popular in the 1990s. By investigating ultra-sensitive features of human perception, he has imaginatively, imaginatively expanded the silicon intelligences, uh, namely the silicon's complex and subtle intelligent capacities. 
Ty Colleen is very pleased with his most recent script, Reindeer Ears. He is able to hear as a reindeer hears. He just finished simulating the intricate parameters shaping the reindeer's auditory neuroanatomy. He listens to Bach now as a reindeer. The biomusic script is ready to be played on the home consoles to play the music of Bach, Mozart, Blondie, whatever music or sound is selected or spontaneously created as a reindeer would hear it. People really enjoy playing these bio music scripts on their home consoles, becoming reindeer, becoming elephant, peacock, snail, whale, butterfly through music and sound. And more important, these scores often become the finest way of knowing about the most rare of species, some now extinct or about to be. Through the bio music scores, we get inside a creature's world by hearing our music as it would. The biomusic scores become synaptic stencils whose patterns we trace. There is a great demand for Ty Colleen's scripts. The most popular are variations on the elaborate MAD scores, which are modulating auditory dimensions. Right now, everyone's favorite, The Leap from Moth to Elephant to Human Listening, is the biggest hit, the top 40 of, 2000, of, of 2021. During the episodes of Intelligent Life, we follow Apliza Kendall and Ty Colleen as they develop their most remarkable work to date, resonant, resonance prints to a new level of sophistication. Resonant prints reminiscent of earlier voice prints are now part of bio music. This is one way by identifying um, a partner's resonance that the silicon partner gradually learns to feel human responses. Ty describes the resonant prints this way. The silicon intelligences can learn to feel my responses. Recognizing and identifying my resonances, the silicon intelligence pretends to be me, simulates my auditory sensitivities. The best for a composer is that the silicon intelligence continues listening, makes investigations, records observations when I'm not around. We're each doing our work, making discoveries, and later get together to compare results. We watch a Pleasa and Thai intensify research, hoping to contemplate soon the more sophisticated listening minds model they have projected. The responder functions well now, the responder being this kind of model of, a, uh, of another person or another um, uh, uh, non-human entity's kind of um, uh, neurophysiological response to sound. Um, as a result of these um, resonance prints. But there is not yet a sophisticated perceiver. And by that, she means kind of the movement of mind, like how each of us individually listens cognitively. Um, this is Supreme Connection Incorporate, in, Incorporated, classified and most sensitive top secret project, Beula. and background to the musical entry. I'll just uh, read one more page here and then um, I'm gonna finish this reading. By 1994, the silicon variation maker scripts were very advanced. This all began with computer software for the home, modifying existing patterns of Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Reich, making, making subtle or not so subtle variations and developments of this music. What became known as first order artificial intelligence scored, scores made it possible to create imitative music cheaply and efficiently. By 1995, such imitative, imitative scores were toys for children. What good was it now to be a great composer? The romance was gone. There was no longer the old joy of sitting in the studio. If five minutes later, they could be elaborated and developed into works of great symphonic proportions by machine intelligences. Frankly, what good was a composer's human brain when scores and patterns uh, and pattern rearrangements in the styles of music um, are, uh, were all written? What did a composer do now? What could be composed that could not be quickly and easily imitated? This became the real challenge. Every composer soon hoped to keep them guessing for at least two weeks 
before his newest composition was duped. And so here you can kind of see um, Amishé anticipating um, this problem of um, uh, increasingly advanced um, AI that are able to um, effectively um, generate any style of music, um, sometimes uh, or potentially even better than, than humans. And she kind of comes to this conclusion that actually the way that composers ought to work in the future or that they could work in the future is by sensitizing further to our own kind of uh, nati native idiosyncrasy um, in terms of our own um, musical cognition. Um, and um, yeah, with that, uh, I am going to conclude this uh, this reading because I'm seeing that I'm going a little bit over. Um, thanks so much to um, Joel, James, and Sean for having me. Um, and I'm really delighted to be a part of this project. Um, thank you very much. My name is Anastasia. What are you doing here? I am a software tester, quality insurance engineer in our company, and I am going to smash the window to record the sound of glass break. I am Arnaldas. Uh, I work at Audio Analytic, and I work as a research engineer. So the purpose is to measure reality against the theory. We know what concrete is, we know what metal is, but we don't know what information is. It's really, uh, I would say, the cutting edge. It's, uh, it's the new frontier, uh, but for the moment, it's really the cutting edge. We are at the forefront. We are the pioneers in this domain. you model the sounds themselves and do better artificial intelligence. We're going to uh, use very sophisticated computer algorithms to actually have the computers somehow model or learn uh, the sound of windows breaking. And then we can uh, put that in the device of our customers.
everything you can imagine in the smart home. And you have a you know, whole lot of applications in the smart home that you could imagine for this technology. Uh, there is a French uh, zoologist called Buffon who established a sort of uh, uh, inventory of animals on the planet. And so, you know, while some animals have four feet, some of them have two only and so on. And we're kind of doing the same with sounds. Sounds, uh, there's a really huge variety of sounds. Some of them are percussive, so breaking a window is a bang followed by some kind of smashes and so on. Windows are a lot uh, harder than, than we think. But the first time I tried to break a window, I was like, boom, it's not breaking. <laughs> so you have to hit very, very hard. Uh, but now what we're doing here is really actual window breaking. We're actually taking a hammer and actually breaking a window. So this is reality. It feels strange. In a way, it's the thing where you would think it would be strange to do it every day, but you get this kind of feeling that feels strange really actually just the first time you do it. The second time, it's still exciting, and the third time it becomes work. <laughs> because you have to keep doing it over and over again. Okay, um, I feel like I came in a little bit too early there. I should have let that linger. Um, that was Hito Stale's um, amazing work with uh, Jules Laplace. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's from a sort of a larger installation work called The City of Broken Windows um, that, that uh, sort of debuted at Castello de, de Rivoli in 2019. Um, you know, I, I sort of don't want to editorialize it too much, really, um, except to say that, um, you know, that uh, the, you know, the, the question of what is listening and to what they're listening. Uh, so, you know, a machine listening or a statistical model uh, listening, you know, is in a really nice dialogue, I think, with... Um, Stefan's reading of Marianne Amache, you know, where we're imagining something like, you know, a, a rain, how a reindeer might listen to bark. Like, well, now this is a machine listening to a window, and there are some kind of some some interesting analogs there. I, I, I um, one thing that doesn't really come through in Hito's um in, in that work from Hito, and this is not in no way a criticism, but I think I think it's interesting is um the the sort of political imaginary or political political economic imaginary of audio, audio analytic the company that she's concerned with and, and and it's sort of hinted at right at the end there by the um um i think it's the ceo that they speak to and i, I just wanted to um show you um a little something about this you know th this organization i hope you can see that um so, so this is the company Audio Analytic, and and you'll see there their slogan: yeah. "We've empowered machines with the sense of hearing." Right. So this is a kind of a mission statement. There's a breaking glass, and you can see that the kind of the project is to catalog sound to make audio events of various different kinds detectable in certain kinds of ways: coughing dogs barking and they frame it in terms of convenience but also security um, but there's also something kind of sort of 
I want to say maybe like feeble <laughs> about um, about the kind of the 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 innovations here. So so the, on one level, you know, there's an enormous amount of work and time and energy and you know resources, as Kate Crawford was referring to, and labor and so on. But look at this ad. Look at this ad um, that they produced. Um, for you know, one of these supposedly amazing applications that comes out of all of this work. Please listen carefully. I'm really struck by this image. Um, yeah, so um, I don't want to say too much more about audio analytics specifically, but um, I, you know, I know that when we were when we were thinking with them, and after watching Hito and Jules's film and and seeing that ad, we were just really struck by the kind of the soundtrack, and that they're and and I've been collecting over. Um, in the past few months now on a Tumblr, a dedicated Tumblr, machinelistening.tumblr, um, all these kind of various kind of weird adv adver advertising materials and kind of uh, sort of overblown rhetorical claims by many of these companies. And, and we, we, we've been really struck collectively by how, um, how machine listening seems to have a kind of a soundtrack, um, you know, in, in this kind of advertising imaginary. And um, yeah, so just I don't know if you want to jump in here, Joel, just to say a few words about um, where where that that kind of led us um, before we move on. Yeah, <clears throat> sure. Do you want to share the um, experiment oh, yeah, sure. Um, sure. on your screen? I mean, I think we um denied for a long time about whether to play that OK Rover um, YouTube and ha having watched, I'm, I'm still undecided. But um, <laughs> one, one of the... Um, you know, aspects of the um, curriculum program is this idea of experiments. So it, it, it's um, a place in, in the curriculum, you, you, you'll find them under the different topic headings, the topics corresponding to each of these Zoom sessions, you'll find experiments, which are kind of um, tasks, um, provocations, ways of engaging with these questions that are sort of pedagogical, but also um you know they are, are open-ended um Im imaginative etc and, and one of the um experiments we set we're calling adversarial audio um ads for advertising adversarial to sort of work um let's say sonically against the logic of um the 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 soundtracks that machine listening organizations like audio analytic use to promote themselves as we have um, put it that the, the soundtrack lubricates uh, and normalizes um, and, and re really, um, you know, operates so perfectly as, as an expression of kind of frictionless um, capital and convenience. Um, so we've set up a YouTube um, a playlist with uh, about uh, 20 or so right now, um, of these um, 
uh, machine listening advertisements. Um, they can be uh, downloaded or ripped. And what we're um, hoping people might do is um, add their own soundtracks to them, um, soundtracks that um, might operate in a more sort of dialectical um, way and, and kind of open up other readings. And there's a little one that um, I've done um, there <laughs> rather pre predictably um, used um, a soundtrack by the Japanese noise artist Mertz Bell. Why don't we play just like 10 seconds of it? <laughs> Fourteen seconds. That'll do. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you can come up with something um, better than that. So, um, also being reminded um, to mention the Discord, um, which Unsound have set up for comments, um, questions, discussion. Um, we've been getting some excellent comments coming through in the chats on all platforms, and we don't um, really have the capacity to sort of answer questions and, and open up those conversations here in the Zoom session, but we'll certainly um, be heading over to the Discord afterwards and over the next few days um, to continue those conversations. So um, just encourage you to um, head over there and, and, um, and, and have a chat. So what are we going to do now? We're kind of moving into um, the last um, two or three segments of, of today's yeah, program. Yeah, that's right. Um, they're kind. Of, I want to say that they're thematically related in a way. Um, we, 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 uh, we've got three artists uh, coming up now, Andre Dow, Jennifer Walsh, and Tom Smith, all of whom are kind of dealing in different ways with machine listening's imperial or colonial dimensions. Um, or, or at least kind of the ways in which machine listening uh, is bound up with ideas of statehood and national identity. So, um, you know, they're dealing with them in totally different ways. Um, um, Jen, Jenny and, and Tom are both composers and musicians in, various, in, in different ways. But Andre, um, who is a, perhaps you want to, I don't know if you're there, Andre, if you feel like popping your head in uh, just to say hello. <laughs> Welcome. Um, thanks so much for coming. Yes, Andre is a, a novelist, writer, editor, researcher and artist. Um, he's actually the co-founder of um, an organization called Behind the Wire, which does amazing uh, work um, with sort of immigration detention, um, sort of the, the travesties of immigration detention the Australian government has been uh, p perpetrating over the last, last few years and, and an award-winning uh, podcast, which is absolutely amazing, uh, called The Messenger. Um, along with some a whole lot of other stuff. Anyway, so we're we're going to be presenting a new work um, from Andre now, um, a video essay called uh, "No Voice Left Behind," and th that this comes out of his doctoral research at the Institute for International Law and Humanities at Melbourne Law School. In July 2016, somewhere in northern Uganda near the city of Gulu, a middle-aged woman uses her mobile phone to call into talkback radio program on 89.5 Speak FM. She is calling in because she has heard that the sanitation in local refugee settlements is very poor. She says that she is worried that there might be a cholera outbreak. The woman and her interlocutor, the talkback radio host, are speaking in Acholi, the predominant language of the area. Their one-minute conversation is just a drop in the ocean of speech broadcast on Ugandan radio that day in 2016. One minute amongst 2,088 hours of radio. 100 or so words amongst 7.5 million. Meanwhile, 11,000 kilometres away in downtown Manhattan, just three blocks from the headquarters of the United Nations, in an office where no one speaks a cholly, a team of data scientists, analysts and engineers are listening to this woman's conversation. The listeners are part of the UN Secretary General's flagship innovation initiative, the UN Global Pulse. Three blocks from the United Nations in New York, a veritable geek squad of data scientists, analysts and engineers are using big data and artificial intelligence for global good. Or as director Robert Kirkpatrick puts it in simpler terms. Our job is to help superheroes find out where people are in trouble so they can rescue them. Here.
to listen to Ugandan radio, the UN Global Pulse developed the radio content analysis tool. The Global Pulse described the tool as a prototype developed to use machine learning to analyze public radio content in Uganda and explore its value for informing development of UN projects and programs on the ground. The logic of the tool is said to be the extraction of signal from noise. There are over 2,000 hours of radio broadcast a day on all of Uganda's radio stations. The tool takes all that noise and filters it down through a combination of machine learning techniques like speech recognition and keyword filtering and human expertise in the form of rapid evaluation by human analysts and transcription and translation. We can see this metaphor of extracting signal from noise visualised on the Global Pulse's website about the radio content analysis tool. On this grey map of Uganda, two small sections representative of different regional administrative units, one in the northwest and the other in the south, are coloured in bright orange. Within each orange coloured district is an animated picture of expanding concentric circles, evoking radio waves spreading out from a central broadcaster and the regular beat of a pulse. Now, as my cursor hovers over the grey area of the map, we hear a jumble of voices begin speaking. To stop hearing this noise, I must move my mouse. Only then does the noise resolve itself into something intelligible. Dunka wa pini biwa keke noni pingo kumbeti ni bebe yugana ti maraja dida. Ibi noni yugana kumbeti has become a regional hub for thugs. Pilu ku mati region me 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 East Africa okolo. Pini wati ki system maraja dida kiri me guako bebe ru padano. This movement from noise to signal, a movement initiated by my hand on my mouse and represented by the transformation of my cursor from a white arrow when it hovers over the grey of the map to a small white hand when it moves over to the orange district, index finger pointed directly at the centre of the pulse, is the performance of crisis and its resolution through the tool. In this way, the radio content analysis tool is presented as nothing more than a simple tool, a filter to make overwhelming data flows intelligible. <laughs> But elsewhere, the radio content analysis tool is presented as much more than mere tool. It brings in people's voices. It leaves no voice behind. These descriptions of the radio content analysis tool echo the language of the Global Pulse's chief data scientist more generally. In this 2017 blog post for the UNHCR's Innovation Service, the Chief Data Scientist wrote that before 2030, technology should allow us to know everything from everyone to show no one is left behind. His immediate example is of nanosatellites imaging every corner of the Earth, allowing us to generate almost immediate insights into humanitarian crises. This is well after Edward Snowden's revelations and the subsequent backlash. So what is going on here that the UN is dreaming of a world of total surveillance? To understand this dream of total surveillance, we have to go back to the origins of the global pulse, and in particular, to the way the pulse deploys the concept of big data. By which I mean that we can't think of the radio content analysis tool and other applications like it, only as a tool. As the sociologist David Beer says, we must prize ourselves away from the data themselves to begin to think historically about how these data are conceptualised. Often we jump to wondering about the consequences of the use of the technology. We might wonder, for example, how the radio content analysis tool impacts the privacy of the woman in northern Uganda calling into talkback radio. But before we can even consider how the radio content analysis tool is used, we must first consider the particular ways of thinking in which the concept of big data is bound.
To think of big data as a concept is to think of it as a Foucauldian program, like the rational schemas of the prison, the hospital or the asylum, which reorganise institutions, arrange space and regulate behaviour. And though they are never fully or faithfully implemented, programs nevertheless induce a whole series of effects in the real by acting as grids for the perception and evaluation of things. In other words, it is critical to find out how the UN begins to understand the world and its role in that world differently as it looks out through the grid of big data, through these shifting fractal lines and the patterns they promise to reveal. In 2011, General Secretary Ban Ki-moon introduced the Global Pulse to the UN General Assembly. The immediate context for the birth of the Global Pulse was the 2008 global economic crisis. He emphasised the speed of the crisis and how that speed created an information deficit. Uh, too often, uh, by the time we have hard evidence of what is happening at the household level, the harm has already been done. Our inability to understand the impacts of a crisis while there is a still time to adjust our policies and programs threatens to reverse years of hard-won development gains. The irony <coughs> is that we are actually swimming in an ocean of real-time information. In this animation shown at the briefing, we see the Global Pulse harvesting data from this ocean of real-time information, an ocean made up of our phone and internet usage, made up, in other words, of everyday life itself. It is also said at the briefing that data is the new oil, and like oil, the extraction of data is big business. Here we see the UN's anxieties about its own competencies coming to the fore. Ban Ki-moon had said that the traditional 20th century tools for tracking international development were redundant, as the harm has already been done. The UN, in other words, has been too traditional. It needs to be cutting edge. And to do that, who can it turn to but big tech? Peter, we'll hear from Dr. Andreas uh, Wiegand who directs the Social Data Lab and teaches at Stanford University. He was the chief scientist at Amazon, where he studied what the company can learn from its customers. Uh, he now advises global corporations on how to take advantage of today's changing business environment. It's this that I think we can also take, that we need to learn better from our customers what they need. And I think one of the, the exciting parts of the, uh, of the Global Pulse is that we can get much closer to our customers, to the people, the poorest and most vulnerable people around the world and what they need. So without... Already at the very beginning of the Pulse, it's evident what the world looks like through this perceptual grid in which the poor and the vulnerable become the UN's customers to be surveilled in the same way that Amazon users attract. The concept of big data is so strong that other concepts that might be thought to resist big data, concepts like human rights, can be transformed when viewed through this grid of perception. In 2014, Ban Ki-moon appointed an independent expert advisory group to advise on a key plank of the UN's post-2015 development plan, the so-called data revolution for sustainable development. The independent expert advisory group's final report, called A World That Counts, makes right central to that data revolution. But the first right listed is one that doesn't really exist, the right to be counted. It is not to be found in the major international human rights treaties, nor is it ever fully explained what the right to be counted means. But it seems from the rest of the report that the right to be counted is thought of as a necessary condition for other rights. There is a play on the meaning of count here, you have to be counted to count, that is, you have to be counted to matter, to have rights. The 
If you're not counted, you're invisible. Or to put it another way, for the first time we see the UN saying that you have to be surveilled, tracked, datafied, in order to have rights. Not only to have rights, but to exist. Here in a blog post by two of the independent experts, one of whom was the Chief of Policy Planning at UNICEF, we see the conflation of the right to an identity with the right to be counted. There is a strange reversal here, where people are apparently empowered by that which disempowers them. A fundamental principle of human rights is participation, that people have the opportunity to meaningfully participate in decisions that affect their lives. But through Big Data's perceptual grid, undisclosed, unconsenting surveillance becomes participatory. As the independent experts rhetorically ask, how can data empower people? Can data provide voice? Which brings us back to this image with which we began of a Ugandan woman in a field. Remember that the radio content analysis tool brings in people's voices. It brings, we are led to believe, this woman's voice in to the UN's decision-making processes. She would not be left behind. The Global Pulse's report on the radio content analysis tool assures us that the tool brings her voice in in a more reliable way than other models of listening. Unlike stimulus response model research like focus groups or surveys, the tool passively filters public radio discussions, thereby reducing biases and lending itself to being scaled up. Literal translation into English ensures the analysis captures the voices of the people and avoids personal interpretations that could distort the data. The claim here is that the tool is objective in a way that other models of listening can't be because the source of bias, the human, is removed as much as possible from the process. Yet there is something odd about these images. Why are these women holding radios up to their faces? These radios, after all, receive signals and play them. They do not transmit. If the pictures say anything about the women, it is that they are listeners, not speakers. Their mouths are closed. They are mute. There is also something oddly devotional in their poses, as if what they are hearing through these radios is transcendent, the holy word, as if they are hearing their own voices being given back to them by big data. Thanks so much to Andre Dow um, for that piece, uh, No Voice Left Behind. Um, there's so much to talk about um, there, um, but I think we'll just um, let the work speak for itself and mention that that was the first um, ever showing uh, of that work by Andre, um, and um, it was... Um, at the invitation um, to participate in this program. And so it was um, really a great privilege to, to be able to um, show that. Um, I'd, I'd now like to introduce uh, the artist Jennifer Walsh, who is um, here with us. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Holding in there, it's um, <clears throat> 20 past 11 in the evening Melbourne time, so it's a little... Uh, later than I'm usually up, but uh, feeling very energized, having a really good time with the machine listening program and so pleased that you can join us um, and talk about your work. Um, I've been a big fan of your work for many years, as you know, and, um, you know, we spent some time together um, in Australia a few years ago on your tour and um, in, in various places in Europe. And I, I know that, you know, you've worked um fairly extensively with ideas around artificial intelligence and human machine interaction. Um, so when we reached out to you um, about being involved with this program, you, you told us about the work that you were working on, Island 
a data set um, which which just premiered, I believe, a few days ago, and that's the work that you're going to um, talk about and present here tonight. Um, well, first of all, just to say thanks a million for inviting me to do this. Um, I feel very honoured to be uh, part of a panel with such amazing people on it. Um, I also second what many people, maybe I'm thirding or fourthing what many people have said, which is that the um, curriculum for me is something which is tremendously interesting because what I notice across the arts is, is so many people are interested in machine learning in general. Um, and whether it's from a music back, whether they've come from a background where they've been trained in music or visual art or from a tech background or from fashion. And, and it feels like it's really fantastic to have this uh, para-educational uh, uh, curriculum set up where sort of we can directly contribute and sort of try to make something happen. Because um, I teach at the University of Music and the Performing Arts in Stuttgart. And this time last year, I taught a workshop on uh, machine learning with uh, the net artist Olia Lialina, who teaches at the Merz Academy, the design school there. And we had students from the puppetry department and Olia felt that these were the most appropriate students uh, that existed that we could be teaching about machine learning and uh, machine consciousness and stuff like that. So I think there needs to be more of this sort of interconnection across different disciplines. So it's awesome that you guys are doing this. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about a piece that premiered last Saturday uh, in Dublin. It's a piece called Ireland, a data set. Uh, this was a piece um, that I worked on over the last year or so. Of course, we had to change how it was going to work a bit because of the pandemic. Um, but my idea for the piece from the get go was that I wanted to use it to sort of look at how Irishness, Irish nationality, uh, is, is basically a performance, it's a construct. I'm sure the second that you hear I'm an Irish composer um, or that you hear Irish people are partying or there's an Irish pub being built in your town, you have certain stereotypes and preconceptions. Um, don't worry, Irish people have them too. Uh, and so I was very interested in sort of looking at the data set that Irishness is constructed out of. Um, because for me, data sets, or we could call it big data, we could call it a data set, we could call it a corpus, if we use the same lingo as, as the computer uh, scientists would, um, or we can call it an archive. Um, these things are not neutral. They're all, to me, incredibly flawed. They're sort of performances, they're choices, they're, oh, it says my internet connection is unstable, but hopefully I'll just keep talking goes wrong just like uh, say something to me in the chat um but these archives these databases they're never 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 neutral they're always um edits their constructs their definitions their choices that people have made so i know for example the work that kate crawford has done with trevor paglin you know on ImageNet, that's fantastic because uh, it sort of helps people see how ImageNet is put together so i was interested in in looking at that it comes out of earlier projects I've done. Um, I did a project called Ashtoch, uh, which I actually have the book. So rather than screen sharing, I'm going to be showing you real physical objects. So uh, this is a, the book that came out of Ashtoch, which was Ashtoch is, it claims to be a foundation, which is the avant-garde archive of Ireland. Uh, but everything that's made that's on there is completely fictional. So we sort of based it on Ubu web. So when you go to the Ashtoch website, um, you know, it says this is a foundation to safeguard and, and um, you know, uh, archive all of the Irish avant-garde work up until 1985, but it's all been completely constructed. It's a sort of a thought experiment in how sort of data might have happened in Ireland or how surrealism might have happened in Ireland or how futurism might have happened in Ireland, because when these artistic developments were happening on the continent, um, you know, you had, uh, Ireland was a country that was still um, occupied by a colonial force, um, and it was a country that was struggling in the, I think in the teens, Ireland had the poorest, worst slums in Europe, in, in Dublin. So, so I was sort of interested in constructing this alternate history. I've done other projects like that. Um, an album that I released earlier this year is called A Late Anthology of Early Music. And this is a machine learning generated um, history of early uh, Western music. So um, John Dowland, uh, Hildegard von Bingen, Palestrina, people like that. And that 
was that was something because I was very interested in the fact that when we teach Western music, when we teach early music, we teach something which we call a canon. And you know, if you're a if you're a kid that's just started studying, you think, okay, the canon is there because people have picked out the best possible pieces, but that is completely constructed. There's lots and lots of exclusions, lots and lots of exclusions on the base of gender or race or sexuality. And so I'm sort of interested in using AI to, to look at this, um, these exclusions, um, to, to look at the way the data set is constructed so that hopefully we can build new types of data sets. So um, I want to show you an excerpt from the piece. Um, the piece is made up of 14 scenes, and I'm going to show you just three short scenes. It's about five minutes in length. And it sort of shows you some of the things that we were doing in the piece. Uh, it's a piece for four vocalists and a saxophonist uh, with video, with a pretty heavy duty video part. Um, so you're gonna see three scenes. The first one is, um, it's, we called it river dance, simply because um, this is sort of uh, constructed, it's, it's constructed by you know, a neural network that's been trained on uh, river dance by Bill Whelan, one of the most famous financially successful uh, musical products to emerge from Ireland as sort of a symbol of the Celtic tiger and Ireland's sort of new economic promise. Um, so we trained, trained uh, neural net on river dance, also trained neural net on the text of river dance um, and sort of put that together as a piece of music. Um, and so for me, this is sort of looking at commercial off the shelf products, uh, which so much of machine learning projects uh, in the music space, specifically in the music space are interested in just things that are trained on MIDI, um, that are trained on, you know, things in 4.4, things in a clear key, uh, which sort of leave a huge amount of uh, music out of, out of the, out, out of that sort of possibility space of what, of what music could be. Um, so there's that. The next scene is, um, from an app called Seeing AI, um, which is produced by Microsoft, which is an app um, to help people with uh, visual difficulties uh, navigate the world. So it's, a, it's an app that's coming from a great place. Um, I was quite surprised when I downloaded the Seeing AI app that like many, many uh, voice assistants, it has Moira, who I, uh, the Irish uh, voice assistant, that seems to be popular everywhere for some reason. People really like this Irish um, voice assistant, which to me is quite bizarre because there's so much wrapped up in the female gendering of, of voice assistants. And then when you also add the Irish aspect, it becomes quite bizarre. Um, but this is sort of me showing seeing AI's limits when it's looking at pictures that any Irish person would recognize and it cannot recognize them. It, it's sort of, it's sort of sh trying to show the audience that's looking at images and where the failures start to occur. And then the last scene that you'll see um, is, a, is a scene that was made by training um, a neural net on Shannos. Now Shannos is a very highly respected um, traditional Irish form of singing. It's not notated, it's highly ornamented, so it's very difficult to capture. Um, it's an oral tradition. Um, it's sort of considered very pure in Ireland, like you, you study Shannos with somebody who teaches it to you, and it's sort of the, the lineage is very, very important. Um, and so I was very interested in taking this and, and training a system on it. And I was lucky because uh, PRISM, uh, which is the Center for Science and Research um, in Mathematics in, and in Music at the Royal Northern uh, College of Music, they helped me with this because they took sample RNN and they retooled it uh, so that they could they could start to allow other people to use it, and then they trained uh, their version of sample or NN on uh, four different Shanno singers. I collected a corpus of four different Shanno singers. Um, so, of course, the results that we got were completely garbled, and uh, instead of being this beautiful, pure, gorgeous Irish folk song, were full of glitches and white noise, as you know, as the network sort of tried to wade into that white noise and carve away everything that wasn't what it thought was Shannos and then lo left lots of bits, lots of artifacts in there sonically. Um, so you could sort of, it's completely garbled. Um, and so I have the singer sing this, but they have to sing it with the same intention as if this is an absolutely gorgeously pure folk song performance that they're gonna do. So for, for me, looking at Irishness, 
looking at what Ireland has been, what it is now, and what we hope it will become. Um, AI is an interesting lens to sort of look at how um, historically an archive is constructed, who's excluded, who's included, how we perform things, how we deem things worthy of inclusion or exclusion, and things like that. So that's sort of what I was doing with the piece. So this is just a short excerpt. It's only five minutes long. It gives you sort of an idea of, of sort of how I try to play with these things uh, performatively in, 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 a, in a performance space. So I think, Lauren, if you could take it away and hit play there. Processing. Probably a herd of cattle grazing on a lush green field. Processing. Probably a screenshot of a mountain. Processing. It seems to be building, text, old, sky, city. Processing, a person standing in front of a beach.
Thanks so much, Jen Jenny. That was amazing. I should say that's uh, Tonta, the vocal ensemble, an Irish vocal ensemble, and Nick Roth on saxophone. It's so much better just... than the um, actual River Dance than the original. So, no, I mean, don't, uh... don't you don't you come for River Dance? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we were just uh, speculating in the chat whether we were in fact listening to that as reindeers, like um, like Amache would have would have wanted. Um, J Jenny, did you have anything else you wanted to say about that work, or um, um, otherwise, no, I think I mean, um... it's, it's uh, difficult uh, to to. I don't want to. I could talk all day about it because it was oh. so. Um, writing the work was one challenge. Rehearsing in masks when everybody's singing was another challenge, right. and then having to conceptualize the piece as an eight-camera live stream where nobody could be in the hall um, except for the performers and the lighting technicians during the performance performers that was a whole other um head wreck uh but a be but a beautiful challenge and i'm grateful i got to do it so thanks so much for for letting us experience it and and for introducing it so beautifully um, um that i mean that just about takes us uh to the point of of doing some goodbyes and um and then uh, kind of introducing the, the the final work of the night there's um thomas smith who's uh, appeared on camera who's who's going to take us out but um before you start tom i think um james and i you, you know just um uh, i guess take the opportunity to thank all of the artists um and um writers and, and contributors who've, who've joined us um, tonight to kick off this program and, um, you know, shared so many amazing ideas um, and brought so so much um, sort of depth and, and um, you know, and, and such rewarding thinking to, to this program. And um, a massive thank you to the audience that's tuned in from all over the place. Um, lots of um, people um, in Europe and, and, and Krakow especially and lots of um, friends in Australia um, tuning in to a, a massive thank you um, to the technicians who helped out um, who, who made tonight possible through their production work um, especially um, Lauren um, and Tony uh, and the team at Unsound especially Popez so thank you for all of your support um, we're going to be back um, this time tomorrow um, and the next day, 1pm um, Krakow time, 9pm Melbourne time and, and lots of time zones in between. Um, tomorrow's session is called um, Lessons in How Not to Be Heard. Um, features um, Halcyon Lawrence, uh, Panopticon Foundation, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, Alex Ahmed, Joel Spring and Jazz Money, Matt Dryhurst and DeForest Brown Jr. So amazing lineup of um, artists and uh, who will be joining us tomorrow. And of course, um, the title riffs on Hitosh Dale's work lessons in How Not To Be Seen. So um, again, um, uh, amazing contribution um, by Hito to helping us think through questions of machine listening. Um, Tom's been very um, patient and we're kind of um, doing something with Tom's work, which is um, something we hope to do e each night, which is a kind of mu musical outro, but it's not um, your typical musical work. It's a, it's a piece. Um, it's a, it's a collection of 10, new songs, top 10, um, made especially for machine listening, um, made by scouring um, Spotify data um, using um, some software that Tom has created, um, producing some truly unusual, borderline unlistenable, but kind of su sometimes surprisingly funky music. Um, Tom, do you want to say anything about the work before we before you start? Oh, I don't think I need to say too much. Just um, I'll just put this link in there. That's the listing that's on your guys, you know, on your website. So if people want to have a look through that as an essay in there about, you know, what I think about 
what I think Spotify's relationship to data is, I suppose, and an explanation of the kind of methodology. And um, so I've, I've kind of put together a little presentation. It doesn't have all the tracks in them in, in the presentation because it would be, I don't know, 130 songs or something, but I've sort of made a little website to kind of take you through um, the top five songs from a bunch of different countries and then kind of play the the um, song for the country. So. Okay, um, so I'll we're going to hear. So we're going to hear. So you're going to present this work as a kind of, um, as a as a sort of um, doing some live browsing, and we're going to hear some examples of um, the songs. And the songs are all named for the countries that they are sort of averaged from, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to sort of operate this website, and um, it should be reasonably clear what's going on, but we'll see. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone. See you all tomorrow.